Prison by design is a place where a number of your rights are either stripped away or are severely limited in some manner. The right most pertinent to the topic of conversation today is the ability to freely access your bank account and or manage any money or assets you may have. In the United States and many other countries, with the exception of a few specific types of crime we'll discuss in more detail in a moment, upon being sentenced, absolutely nothing whatsoever will happen to your money, property, or assets. In fact, an often unforeseen downside of being arrested and sent into prison is that you're still on the hook for all of the financial obligations you committed to prior to being arrested and sentenced, including rent, bills, and of course, debts. But of course, at this point, you're likely to have lost any way to make any significant amount of money to pay said bills. So if you head to prison with a phone contract or even something like a Netflix subscription, that money will continue to be vacuumed out of your account each and every month. And due to the fact that you're in prison, canceling or freezing these contracts is made exponentially more difficult. And from a practical standpoint, resolving this sort of thing can be impossible for some inmates. For this reason and others, many lawyers strongly advise getting your financial life, including settling any debts and getting rid of any bills you can, in order before any kind of potential prison sentence to avoid an unnecessary loss of funds or leaving prison in a worse financial situation than when you entered it, which is extremely common for most inmates. This can be difficult, however, for those suddenly arrested and unable to post bail in order to potentially have an interim period between jail and prison to get everything in order. Then again, depending on the amount of time you're sentenced to serve, having something like a Netflix account or similar subscription that takes a very small amount of money from your account each month can actually be a good idea for some inmates. The reason being that it is the policy of most banks to freeze accounts if no activity is recorded on it for a set amount of time. The amount varies from bank to bank, but around 6 to 12 months of inactivity seems to be a good ballpark figure for when this generally occurs according to our research. Further, if your account has been frozen for more than 15 years, at least in the UK, the government is allowed to take any money in such an account and distribute it to worthy causes, though technically you're still supposed to be able to recover the money even then if you happen to be able to track it down after all that time. On that note, if your account is frozen, a bank should have no problem unfreezing it provided you can jump through the required hoops. The problem being that unfreezing an account from within a prison is, from a practical standpoint, generally an effort in futility, with the best case scenario being that you'll be able to get the account unfrozen after many months of effort and help from someone on the outside. Thus, lawyers generally advise making nominal payments into or from a given account while in prison to avoid this happening. A problem here, of course, is that while in prison in many regions of the world, you are forbidden or severely restricted to any direct access to any bank accounts you have. This might all have you wondering, how do you make any payments or deposits from prison? While in the UK, prisoners are allowed to make limited banking transactions of a personal nature, provided they are to either help you to maintain your personal affairs whilst in prison and help assist you to resume a regular lifestyle on release. For example, a British prisoner can issue checks, pay debts, and even authorize the sale of properties and assets within reason or run a legitimate business in a limited capacity. However, there are often severe restrictions to access to telephone and internet banking if access is given at all, meaning for most inmates any banking has to be done via mail. It should also be noted here that access to mail and what correspondence are allowed in and out for a given inmate can often be severely restricted as well. In addition, on both sides of the pond, most inmates usually have access to special prison accounts usable within the prison. This account can be used to buy things from the commissary, like toiletries or even personal items like TVs or radios, at the discretion of prison officials. Moving swiftly along, one key difference between the way the American system works compared to the system in the UK is that bank accounts cannot be used directly by inmates to conduct personal banking transactions in the United States. In contrast, in the UK, they can, and an individual can transfer money from the prison account to a personal account or even to another person's account entirely to pay debts and the like. Again, an option not directly available to prisoners in the United States. As you might imagine from this, before being sentenced, it is strongly advised that you give someone on the outside official full access to all your finances and accounts with any entities either through something like a blanket power of attorney or even something as simple as opening a joint bank account with them and putting all your money in there. Of course, while it is possible to give someone else control of your financial assets, such as a loved one, lawyer, or financial expert, there are pros and cons to each option. For example, transferring control of your financial assets to a loved one usually intentionally leaves them ability to do pretty much whatever they want with your assets. This can be a good or bad thing depending on the person. 
And if you're wondering, none of what we've discussed changes if you're sentenced to life in prison, and a person on the receiving end of such a sentence is still required to settle any and all debts. Then again, as you might imagine, one's credit score in paying one's debts is pretty low on the priority list of those who really think they'll never be released from prison, or that it might be decades. Although occasionally people are paroled from even life sentences, so most lawyers still strongly advise even these people to do their best to settle their financial obligations, so that if they do ever get out, they'll not put themselves behind the eight ball any more than they inherently already are after committing a crime that would get an extremely lengthy sentence in the first place. And as to the event that a prisoner dies in prison, it's no different to if a person dies outside of prison, and their remaining assets, if any, will be divided up in accordance with their will or debt obligations. The exception to all of this, though, is if the authorities believe a person has benefited financially in some way from the crimes they are accused of, in which case many governments, including the US and the UK, have broad authority to seize and distribute assets as they see fit. In the UK, for example, this allows the authorities to distribute, seize money and assets to charity use them to fund community projects in an area affected by a crime, or even give the money directly to a victim of a crime as a form of compensation. For the most part, though, assets are sold and added, along with the money, to government coffers for the purpose of fighting crime. This is essentially what happens to seize assets and monies in the U.S. as well, with assets being sold at police auctions and the like, with money going back to the authorities and, in some cases, directly to the state or federal government. However, the extent to which a person benefited financially from their crimes cannot be ascertained in both the US and the UK, the authorities will attempt to freeze their bank accounts, essentially preventing them from being used in any manner previously described. This continues while everything is sorted out. But in a nutshell, even if one is sentenced to life in prison or just a month, a person, depending on where they are in the world, usually has extremely limited access to their various assets behind bars, despite still being obligated to pay any bills and debts as if they were still gainfully employed and a free individual.